Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's presentation, A Theology for the Church's Present Moment. It is my pleasure to introduce our speaker. Richard Lanann is a priest of the Diocese of Maitland, Newcastle, Australia, and he was ordained in 1983. Father Lanann has a degree in history from the University of Newcastle, a baccalaureate in sacred theology from the Catholic Institute of Sydney, a Master of Philosophy degree from the University of Oxford, and a doctorate in theology from the University of Innsbruck in Austria, where his dissertation was on Karl Rahner's ecclesiology. After graduate studies, he taught systematic theology at the Catholic Institute of Sydney, and during this time, he was a member of the Australian Anglican Catholic Dialogue, and served as president of the Australian Catholic Theological Association from 2005 to 2007. For the Lanan moved to the United States in 2007 to teach at the Weston Jesuit School of Theology. And he's currently professor of systematic theology here at the Boston College School of Theology and Ministry, where he currently chairs the ecclesiastical faculty. His, richer, his research and teaching focus on ecclesiology, ministry, and the theology of Karl Rahner. Father Lanan has authored or edited nine books, the latest being Tilling the Church, Theology for an Unfinished Project, and as co-editor, Priestly Ministry and the People of God, Hopes and Horizons. He is an editorial consultant for theological studies, and in 2019 served as a theological advisor to the preparation of a document, Light from the Southern Cross, which is a document on reforming governance in the Catholic Church in Australia. Most recently, he was a member of the theological panel for the Plenary Council of Australia. A wonderful colleague, and a great friend to the continuing education program. We are very blessed to have him lead this year's annual ministry renewal day. Welcome, Father Lanan. Good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Mick, for that. It's uh, lovely to be here. Thanks to Megan and to Cara and to James for their organization of today as well. And as Megan's already noticed, thank you to all those who lead our prayer. Today's topic, a theology for today's church, is really an, an attempt to identify some resources that we might have in our present moment to address our needs as a church, a way to hopefully uh, encourage creativity and hope. I should preface this too by saying it's not a recipe for how you fix everything that might be broken at the moment, but at least it's the identification of resources that can enable us to address this moment. And to do this, I want to draw on Pope Francis's notion of integral ecology and construct a parallel to how we might think about the church. If you've been following the COP27 going on in Egypt at the moment, you know that one of the, the great questions for those, for those meeting there is the question that we've been grappling with for the last decade or two now, how do you keep temperature rises to 1.5 degrees Celsius when we're already way above that? What Pope Francis does in Laudato Si, his document on our common home, is something quite different from that. I'm sure he too is concerned about global temperature rises, but in calling for an integral ecology, he takes a far wider framework as a way to address the needs of the present. His framework is, of course, the action of God that brings about creation and the implications that that has for how we understand ourselves. So those two dimensions, that all life comes from God and 
as recipients of that life of God, all of us are implicated in how we respond, how we treat our environment, but more fundamentally for Francis, how we treat one another. So for him, the question of ecology is not simply a question of climate, it's a question of how we understand ourselves as human beings. And in that spirit then, what Francis is promoting is really the, the total renewal of humanity, a renewal of our spirituality, a renewal of our relationships with one another, and as part of that, a, re a renewal of our relationship with the earth. So he's very strong in Laudato Si on the fact that you can't fix issues of climate without addressing the wider concerns of what makes a human society. Health policy, housing policy, education policy, where you locate factories, where you locate power plants, where you locate roads, so that there's a need to listen, he says, over and over, to both the cry of the earth, but also the cry of the poor. So an integral ecology is an attempt to do both of those things in a framework constituted by recognising the whole of life as God's gift, by recognising that we're called into relationship with all that shares with us God's life. So in light of that, what I want to do is to see if we can construct an integral ecclesiology, an integral approach to thinking about the church. So this is me, not Pope Francis, but I'm happy to license it to Francis if he's really interested. So I think an integral ecclesiology needs to do a number of things. And again, apropos of the integral ecology, not just to fix little bits of the church, but to rethink the whole reality of who we are as church. And there's, there's any number of, of foci here. But fundamentally, it's to recognise, just as integral ecology begins with recognising the whole of our living creation as God's gift, so to recognise the church as God's gift, that the church is first God's action before it's any of our actions. It's the work of Christ and the Spirit living with us. And that has implications for how we are. It, it's not God fitting into our structures, but we being transformed by responding to the life that we have from God. And part of that is this willingness to be a self-critical community, not, not to take for granted that we are automatically doing what God wants us to do. It's then to look at the, the constitutive dimensions of our life together as church, communion, worship, mission, our tradition, how to... How do we go on being nourished by all of these things that are part of this one presence of God in who we are as a communion of faith? And, and this is an echo into synodality that I'll talk about at the end this morning, to recognise that all of us have a contribution to make here, that this is not just a work for some members of the church. It's not just a work for those in authority. It's, if we're going to have a renewed church, it requires the engagement of all of us. And just to, to summarise that into more um, concise tasks, I think there's a, a series of interrelated tasks that we can identify here. This one might sound so self-evident as to not be worth thinking about, but I want to make the case it's important we go back to the very basic issue. What are we talking about when we talk about the church? How do we understand that term? I'm forever haranguing my students to be really conscious when they use the term the church of who are they including? Who's not included when you use that term? 
And do you use that term in a way that even includes yourself? Or is the church always somebody over there rather than us? The second task is to think about who we are in relationship to history. And by history, I don't mean the past. I mean past, present and future. That we, we live as a community of faith. We live in time. So how we understand ourselves as people of faith in the context of that changing history is going to affect who we are as church. In other words, it's overcoming a division between the church on one hand and the rest of life on the other. The third element then is to ask what is it that as church we are meant to do? How are we meant to live our lives if we are going to be responsive to what God initiates and continues? There's no set answers here. There's not a set of answers given in advance. Rather, we as people of faith, as a pilgrim community, are creating our future. We are shaping it by the decisions that we make. And so being in touch with what are the possibilities for this moment of our life is a crucial dimension of the act of faith as a community. And as part of that then is to recognise that we need to hold together past, present and future. Uh, we are talking about the church in the present, but the church in the present is shaped by the past, just as the church of the future will be shaped by today when we become somebody's past in the future. So we're never working in a vacuum here. Now, all of those tasks are enough for at least one course and probably multiple courses. So in order to make sure we get out of the room by 12 o'clock, I won't do every single one of those in gruesome detail. So I want to do this in, in a shorthand way. To begin with thinking about the church, I, I'm going to draw on the French theologian Yves Congar, something that Congar wrote in 1950, so way before Vatican II even. And this is his description of the church. Three elements to note here. Firstly, that word synergy. We're so used to that word synergy now in terms of so many things, but Congar's using it as part of how to describe the relationship between God and ourselves. And there are two dimensions that need to work together, what God initiates and then us. And it's really important to keep in mind, and we all know this at some level, that we're not God's equal, that God's presence in our lives is life-giving, is unrestrained, is constant, and we are people who are free to say no to all of those gifts. So our limitations and our fallibility is always a dimension of how we live our life of faith, including how we live our life as a church. And what that's going to mean is that we're never going to get to the stage where we've got a perfect church or we've got a church that no longer needs to keep moving that no longer needs to be converted. And in a, one other application of this is that we are always trying to be church in a context. So people, we, we don't come up with just a better theory of church. It's how do we live church? And how do we then respond to those gifts of God the movement of Christ and the Spirit in this community of faith, in the context where we are. So we need to hear how people are living church. I mean, and that is a central element of what synodality is inviting us to, to hear where people are already seeking to live as communities of faith. And again, I'll come back to that before we finish. The other element I, I want to emphasise is this importance of history. 
of recognising that we live in time and that questions change over time. So this is Vatican II. This is from Gaudium et Spes. The starting point again, that God's action is already going on in our life. It's not that we're waiting for God to do something. God's already moving. What we need is how are we going to respond to this? And what we're looking for, what we're trying to be attentive to, is where is that presence of God already in our world? It's really crucial to keep in mind, again, this is something we know, but something we can be inclined to forget, that we are not putting God into the world, that God is already there. And our task is to try to be alert to where God is. This theme from Gaudium et Spes that can be summarised as to read and interpret the signs of the times in the light of the gospel. That's its most famous formulation in Gaudium et Spes Article 4. But you can find it in multiple formulations all through Gaudium et Spes. It was a central theme of that whole document. Where, as church, are we sensitive to the presence of God already at work in our world? And this is, I think, well summarised by by Sandra Schneiders. We take seriously both that God's spirit is at work in our church, in us as human beings, but where God is at work is inseparable from the context in which we live. Its questions, its needs, its strengths, its limitations. In other words, God doesn't choose to be at work in only a much better world than the one we happen to have. God chooses to be at work where we are. That ultimately is the message of incarnation, that incarnation doesn't come about under a perfect set of circumstances. Incarnation comes about in the midst of the messiness of human reality. And so on Sunday when we read the gospel for the Feast of Christ the King, we're not reading about triumph and glory, we're reading about crucifixion. That the kingship of Christ is revealed most fully on the cross. So God doesn't need a perfect world in order to work. God's quite happy to work in the world that we have. And our task is, again, th this is not a a sort of resignation where we say, well, there's nothing we can do. It's rather the very opposite. It's rather recognising where God is already present and asking how we actually build on that presence of God, that gift of God's liberating grace. So a couple of things to, that I will end with this part on with, with questions for you to think about together there. Namely, does everything that we do as church, does it actually reflect the good news? Do we, in other words, embody what we say we are about? Now, at any given moment on our history, in our history of course, we're always going to be somewhere along the, the spectrum of yes and no. Uh, but we also need to keep stopping and asking these questions rather than just moving on to the next thing. And part of that is the need to develop a habit of being self-critical. And self-critical doesn't mean demeaning ourselves or putting ourselves down or saying there's nothing good about ourselves, but it is recognising Congar's point that what grace enables is always affected by our limitations. And if we are to more fully appropriate what God is enabling, then we need to recognise in ourselves the barriers to it. So let me finish there and just invite you to think about those questions or talk about those questions rather with each other on your table. And while you're doing that, we'll pass around a handout that will be the basis for the second part of this presentation. So let me give you a few minutes with each other, please.
So I want to go back to that slide from Gaudi et Spes and use this part of the presentation to think about the challenges that it puts to us, the needs and longings that we as a church, as people of faith, share with other people of our time in the midst of looking for where the signs of God's presence are. So the handout that you were just given, and, and what I want to do in this session is, is talk to this handout a little bit, so rather than just read it, but, but what, what I've tried to do here is to identify what we might call some of the signs of our times. Now, I don't think it would be possible to give a definitive list of those signs, but, and all of us can draw up our own list, and I'd encourage you to do so, to think about that. So there are multiple things that are signs of our times. Each of them raises questions for us about who we are as church and how we are in our world. The thing about signs of the times, and, and this for me is the, the framing point of all of this, is that none of us get to choose them. They're the givens of our world. And we can fight against them and usually drive ourselves crazy in the process, but we can't make them go away. The question then is how do we engage with them constructively and creatively? Which means, in the context of the church, how do we engage with them out of our own tradition, using our own resources? So we hear a lot nowadays about culture wars and churches and people of faith are often seen as sort of inveterate culture warriors. But but that's not a gospel principle, that the only way to respond to our present is to take up the cudgel against it. Uh, which is not to say that everything about the shape of life in the present is unequivocally good. It is to say it's not unequivocally bad. And our challenge is to live in the space where we try and discern the movement of God's spirit and where we actually are drawn together with our contemporaries rather than seeing them as people who simply are our opposition. So for each of those points that I've named there, beginning with COVID, if you think about it, it's quite extraordinary that three years ago, none of us had heard the word COVID, if COVID is actually a word or rather than an anagram. And yet, in the last three years, COVID is not simply something we've become aware of, you know, somewhere over on the fringes of our consciousness. COVID has changed the world. That's not an exaggeration. That's not hyperbole. Think about what we haven't done in the last three years because of COVID. Now, is COVID... A theological question, well, probably not in itself, but the implications of COVID are questions for who we are as a church. So if you think about it in 2020, most of us didn't get to celebrate Easter in a church. That's not a small statement if you think about it, that Easter simply didn't happen liturgically for us. So COVID has had implications for us. So all I'm trying to do with all of these is not, again, wrestle them all to the ground and say, well, this is what we should be doing, but to at least allow in the question. And then allowing in the question also then calls us to think about what resources we have as a community of faith to address those questions. And to think about where those questions call us as individuals but also as communities 
to begin to act differently. So this is one dimension of that being a self-critical community. There's so many things that are going on in our world at any given time. Rather than seeing them as things that are threats to us, I prefer that we think about them simply as things that are questions to us and that call for a community that is able to, to move. Everything we say about ourselves as church coming out of Vatican II is predicated on recognising that we, we have here no earthly home. You know, one of the achievements of the council in its thinking about the church is what you can call its eschatological orientation. And, and that simply means that, that the council locates the church as a body moving to the fullness of life, not a body that's already arrived one inescapable consequence of Vatican II's ecclesiology is there is no golden age in the life of the church. Or if there is, the golden age is eschatological, it's certainly not past. So at any given point, we are on the pilgrimage to the fullness of life in Christ. But in the here and now, we already experience that fullness at least in, in hints, if you like. And the hints are where the discernment needs to take place. Where is God's spirit? And part of that is to ask ourselves whether we can be a learning community and not merely a teaching community. Again, one of the significant contributions of Gary Metzpez is to recognise explicitly that the church can learn from other sources of knowledge, can learn from psychology, can learn from educationalists, can learn about peace by listening to people who have spent their life working for peace. And if you think about developments in the last generation, so many aspects of human rights, including rights for women, have challenged the church to think about itself. I mentioned earlier about Francis and ecology, which a movement he's embraced and has come to be a leader in, in particular ways. But the impetus for the ecological conversion of the church has come from outside of the church. It, it hasn't been something that we as people of faith have initiated. Now, what it's helped us to do is to be aware of our own resources for responding to those ecological challenges. But if we ref have refused, had refused to listen to the world, then we'd be sitting over on the sidelines somewhere. In Catholic theology at the end of the 19th century, people could say with a straight face and seriousness, there are no questions left. We have answered every question. Now, they were able to say that by ignoring a 100 years of upheaval in Protestant theology and work on the premise that we are immune from all of that, that's never going to affect us. As the 19th century trickled over into the beginning of the 20th century, all of this blew up in what was called the modernist crisis. And the, the Catholic response to modernism, which was really when the new questions began to affect Catholic theology and not merely Protestant theology, the Catholic response to that modernist crisis was to crush it, to put the modernist beyond the pale. And that shaped Catholic theology for the next 50 years. Uh, it didn't mean people stopped doing creative theology. It simply meant they had no permission to do creative theology and they were in trouble if they did it, or at least if they did it and got found out. Uh, so, 
we're, we're, we're paying a price in lots of ways for even our immediate history where this is not what we've done together, not what there's been encouragement to do. I mean, and it's not as if those discouraging attitudes have gone away completely either. But nonetheless, we are in a new situation. And that one of the tests for us that's represented by these points, I think, is whether we as community of faith are willing to engage positively and creatively with our world rather than to situate ourselves on the margins of it. Now, clearly, what Pope Francis is doing is advocating that we do not stay on the margins. He wants us to go to the margins, if you like, in a positive sense, not to marginalise ourselves by disengagement. Engaging in these questions is challenging. There are things in there that don't fit neatly onto a lot of existing models of how we are church together. The question for us is whether we can make the act of faith that the spirit can be found in the midst of all of this. The, the missiologist, the theology of mission, uh, John Fuhlenbach, who's a German divine word missionary, has this wonderful expression I really like, that as, as Christians, our task is to sniff out the presence of the Spirit in the world beyond ourselves, to sniff it out. And to do that, we need to develop our own sensitivity for what the movement of the Spirit looks like. So we need to keep being grounded in our own traditions, our own history of where we have or have not responded to the Spirit, and learn to, to look at our world through those lenses. There's a wonderful German expression that I like that, that is, is a Fingerspitzengefühl. It's one of those super long German words. And a Fingerspitzengefühl is the feeling at the tip of your fingers. And the whole idea is it's about sensitivity. I always think about old black and white gangster movies when they're cracking a safe and you, know, you have to sandpaper the tip of your fingers so that you can feel the tumblers click into place. It's much easier now in today's heist movies. They just put an electronic device and it decodes the safe. It's not, it takes all the fun out of safe cracking, I think, but anyway. Uh, but but it, it's developing a sensitivity to the movement of the spirit. And you develop that sensitivity, we collectively develop that sensitivity by being people who ourselves live out of that spirit. So that Francis says in Evangelium Gaudium that we don't hear the voice of God as a stranger. If we are people created by grace, then God's voice is our natural, the natural voice for us but we need to develop a sensitivity to be able to hear it. And as we do that, so it becomes more possible for us to recognise where that voice is already being spoken in our world beyond ourselves. So, with that in mind, again, what I'd ask you to do is to it's not a matter that you've got to work through all of these, but think about for yourself, what would you name as the signs of the times that are challenging us as church to think about where the spirit is or is not present? And what are the implications that you would see in terms of how we are to be church together? So, over to you. So this session has as unwieldy a title as I thought I could come up with. Uh, but it, 
uh, it's designed at least to try and capture the three things I want it to capture, which is that we are a future-oriented church, that basic point that I was making in the prior session, but that at any given time we are always shaped by our past. So history matters. It's not merely something to overcome. It's often a gift. And the third thing is we have to live in our present. And the challenge then is to hold the three together. We can't live in the past because it's no longer there. We can't live in the future because it's not here yet. We can only live in the present. But our living in the present can be informed and shaped by the past just as it can orient us to the future. And one way to think about holding all of that together is this phrase that comes from Serene Jones, which I find is an enormously helpful phrase, that we live as a church with a bounded openness. It's paradoxical, of course, because each of those words could sound like contradictions of each other. The church's life is open because the church is not yet complete. It's called to that eschatological orientation. But at the same time, who we are is bounded such that we're not free to make up the church from scratch, to begin again as if not only we have no past, but that we are totally independent of God's initiative. So I see this as a very positive phrase rather than a limiting one. And what I'd like to do as we begin this session is is just try to name some of the features of this bounded openness. And integral to it, of course, is the church is bounded because the initiative comes from God and not from us. It's ultimately God's church. It's also bounded because... There's a whole lot of other people in it other than me. I don't get to choose the other people who are part of the church. And on my better days, I regard that as a gift. On my other days, yeah, not so much. But the inescapable reality is nobody gets the church of their own design. I'm sure there's lots of days where Pope Francis thinks, Gee whiz, you know, if I could just get rid of a few cardinals or a few bishops, life would be so much better. So he has to deal with this too. Nobody is exempt from this. This part is really the extension of the second uh, session we were doing, that the questions will not stop coming. So it's not a question of, it's not a matter of rather, that If we get all this worked out now, we're fine for the next 50, 60, 150 years. Because later today there will be another question and tomorrow there will be a different one again. So it's what allows us to keep moving, to keep in mind that we are a church of pilgrims and not a club of the perfect. There is, has not been, is not and will not be a perfect church. I tell my students, if you want a perfect church, though, I can give you a three-point formula that will guarantee one, and that is start your own church, don't let anybody join, and don't join it yourself. (laughs) If you do those three things, you get a perfect church. Otherwise, you get the church with the complexity that we have, the complexity that is ours. And integral to that is that part of what binds us is we are always people called to conversion. And the benefits of discipleship, the gift of discipleship, is not separable from that conversion. So we are always people have to live as church in this paradoxical relationship uh, that we are called to freedom, but to appropriate that freedom, uh, we need to be people who are willing to keep changing. 
to live all of this, I said at the very beginning this morning that I'm not aiming to give you a plan for how all of this can be fixed. What I think we can do is identify what we can call foundations and resources. And by foundations, I don't simply mean those things that are there at the beginning. I mean what continues in an ongoing way to be at the heart of the church, to enable us to be free, to be creative, to be hopeful. And ultimately, of course, that's about the presence of God to us. But it also generates resources that we can use for this creativity. Part of it is to recognise that as a church, we are a living reality. And to understand that dynamism is integral to who we are as people of faith. It, it's not, we are not an object that has been or can be completed. We are people called into relationship with the living God. The single largest resource that we have as a church is one another. The gifts that we have as a baptised people. The challenge there, of course, is how do we appropriate that gift? Again, that leads us to think a little bit more about synodality, which I'll do shortly but to recognise that there's no group in the church who are there to consume what somebody else does. We are participants, not consumers. And so the well-being of the church is going to depend on our capacity to access the giftedness, the life of the Spirit in all of us. And that's what the ongoing call of God's living word, of the sacramental life where we encounter the spirit uh, that calls us to pilgrimage and mission. So those resources are not merely, don't merely belong to a point of our history. They're our constant resources that we can draw on. And... I've made this point a few times already this morning that as a church we are called to hold in relationship the past, the present and the future. This is a quote from Maurice Blondel. Blondel was a French philosopher, theologian, writing in the late 19th century and early 20th century. He was one of those people who tiptoed around the edge of the modernist crisis and was able to avoid being condemned This is something he wrote in 1904. With the help of the past, the church liberates the future from the unconscious limitations and illusions of the present. It doesn't canonise any one period of history. It canonises the relationship between the periods of our history. What's most challenging about this quote, I think, is the last phrase, the unconscious limitations and illusions of the present. Because at some level, I think there can be a sense where we say, oh, hang on, he's got that wrong. It's the past that had limitations and illusions. We've grown out of those. It's very sobering to think that in 50 or 100 years' time, Somebody is going to look back on us and say, how did those people manage to walk upright? They didn't seem to get anything. So all periods of history are limited. doesn't mean they have nothing to offer, but we have to be humble enough, I think, and part of that humility is not just uh, recognising our limitations, it's recognising the ongoing pilgrimage, that we are not at the end of this. And to try and name briefly what can help 
what can contribute to this ongoing pilgrimage, I think there are a few things we can identify. We hear a lot at the moment about discernment because it is integral to how Francis is presenting um, synodality. And discernment, of course, has a, a strong place in various Christian traditions but beyond the Christian tradition as well. What, what I find really crucial about Francis is how he frames discernment and how he frames it in a way that challenges all of us to realise that discernment is not getting God to agree with me. So this is what he says. I'm not sure who translated the solipsistic self-analysis or egotistical introspection, but I really like it. But look, look at the key phrase there that I've put in bold. An authentic process of leaving ourselves behind in order to approach the mystery of God. He's not saying we have no ideas worth pursuing. He is saying that if we cling only to our own ideas as the sum total of what is possible, we risk making God smaller than God is. And that, of course, is the besetting sin of humanity from the opening chapters of the book of Genesis, that we really want to be God. And in order to do that, we need to displace God who's already God. The alternative is to keep opening ourselves to all that God enables. And the, the final part of this is to recognise that if we do so, we are drawn into God's own creativity. If the, the central feature of what it is to be God is to give life, then the more we are in touch with that God, the more that God's life is framing, forming us, then it's going to be reflected in how we live, how we give life in a whole variety of ways that are going to be particular to the context in which we operate. But it's not simply a matter of willpower. It's not I'm going to go out there and be kind to people. I'm going to go out there and love everyone even if it kills me. It's allowing our hearts to be changed first so that we have the freedom to give of ourselves. And so Francis frames discernment not as we're going to take time to work out how we can get our program for the way that we would like the church to be, but that rather we will listen to what God is enabling for us. And what I want to suggest is he puts that at the heart of synodality. Now, again, we, we, we all know how much information there is about synodality at the moment, all the documents and so on. Uh, so I'm going to do synodality in a single quote. Perhaps even in a single word. And that's the word listen. And the listening requires the recognition, oops, sorry, it requires the recognition that we all have something to learn. That un unless we listen, we're going to be less than what is possible. One of the, the great gifts of my life in the last couple of years has been being part of the Plenary Council in Australia. Uh, and the Plenary Council was this fully canonical gathering of the church in Australia that was organised over four years, because that's the other thing about synodality, you, you can't do it in five minutes. Uh, it takes planning, it takes a whole lot of discernment and gathering opinions and working out how to proceed and refining procedures and so on. But when we gathered in Sydney for the second session of the, the council, the first session was held over Zoom uh, because of the, the pandemic, uh, 
when we gathered in Sydney from a Sunday to a Saturday in July, in the middle of that week we had an explosion about some motions that were uh, rejected by some members and ultimately rejected by the bishops as well. Uh, and rather than proceed, it's like, well, I'm sorry, those motions lost, we'll go on to the next one. Uh, the, the, the synod, the, the council took the time to ask, how might we proceed now? What does this conflict require of us in the here and now? So rather than saying, look, here's our agenda and we've got timetables and we're going to have to stay on those timetables, it was the willingness to say that we need to listen to what the Spirit might be saying to us in this here and now. And ultimately, through that process, the Plenary Council was able to pass its motions about the engagement of women in the life of the church and actually do it, I would argue, in a much stronger way than was present in the motions that were rejected. I think the most powerful text of the New Testament is Acts 15, where they come to that conclusion that these decisions have seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. At one level, that could be the most arrogant statement in the history of the church that we're saying the Holy Spirit has agreed to us, with us. But that's not what they're saying. They're saying we've come to recognise that this is the movement of the Spirit. And that, I think, is what synodality uh, it tries to express at its best, that it begins with the openness to listen to the Spirit, the openness to be converted, and then to hear where the wisdom of the Spirit might be in everybody's voice. And then move that towards how you do make decisions that can be embodied in the life of the church. And I do think, unequivocally really, that that's what the Plenary Council in Australia was able to do. And just to underscore the importance of that, this is Francis on the urgency of listening. This is from his document on young people in the church, Christus Vivit, that came out of the Synod on Young People. And if you read enough Francis, you'll know that warning the church against becoming a museum it is a constant refrain for Francis. That, that there's no virtue in simply being a collection of old things. So over and over in Evangelii Gaudium and in his other works, he, he says it's not a matter of preserving something that is beautiful simply because it's old. If it no longer serves our mission, if it's not encouraging us to be open to conversion, if it's not helping us to be aware of the mission, then it's lost not, not its meaning, but it's, it's living its capacity to give life to who we are as a church. And one, simply one illustration of this, I, I put this under the heading of possibility. Now, there's lots of things you might want to think about in terms of what are the questions that we face as a church in terms of our inner life, not just our mission, but even our inner life, how we relate to each other and so on. Because what I think synodality is raising for us, and it's where it's really important that we recognise that synodality is not a silver bullet that's going to fix everything. And in fact, in the short term, it's probably going to exacerbate some of the tensions. Because if we've had a long history of not really listening, that the struggle to listen is really quite gruelling. And particularly to do it in an environment of social media and so on, where it's much easier to condemn than to listen. And if at the heart of what's often most problematic for lots of people about the life of the church, it stands the figure of the bishop, I find fascinating how Francis thinks about his own ministry as bishop. And he gives three possibilities in this. This is from Evangelii Gaudium. 
if you think of this spatially, that there are three locations of the bishop that he's identifying. Out in front, calling people on and encouraging them. In the middle of them, listening, being, again, encouraging, being hopeful. And then third, which is the one that I find most fascinating, following, allowing himself to be led, allowing the flock to strike out on new paths. And significantly, he prefaces that by that phrase, above all. Now, that's not probably for most of us the, the above all that we would put as the role of the bishop. We're probably most used to the first one or at least a variant on the first one. Whereas he's saying what we are called to be as church, what ministers in the church are called to be, and more explicitly what bishops in the church are called to be, are not the ones who simply make all the decisions, not the ones who don't need to listen because they already know the answers, but rather the ones who can gather all that's been listened to uh, and encourage the gifts of all of the baptised. It's a very different model for not just a lot of theologies of the episcopate, but for much of the practice of the episcopate, both in the past and even in the present. So to bring all this to an end, I'll give the very last word, not to Pope Francis, but to my friend Carl Rana. On this, the nature of a continuing pilgrimage. We come from a beginning that we ourselves did not initiate. We plod along like pilgrims on a road whose end disappears into the incomprehensibility and freedom of God. We are stretched between heaven and earth, and we have neither the right nor the possibility of giving up either one. That's a recipe for living in the space where we are, while recognising that that space is defined in part by where we've come from and where we're going to. But at any given moment, all we have is this space, where we are now. And the challenge of that is, is this a space in which we can recognise the presence of God's Spirit? Is this a space in which we can celebrate that present, that presence in our world and in which we, as a community of faith, can open ourselves to the conversion that the Spirit is calling us to. So I'm going to finish there. I'm going to give you a few minutes with each other just to talk about some of the things we may have done in this last session, and then we'll take the last 20 minutes or so for questions. But can I hand it back to you and just to, to talk to your neighbours for a few minutes, please? Uh, Richard, I, I, I'm just fascinated by um, the, what you had to say about the, the process in, in Australia, and I know how very much involved in that you were. Can you expand a little bit more on that and maybe help us understand why the process worked as well as it did in Australia and seems to be stalled here in the United States? <laughs> I, I'm not sure I can exegete the American church terribly well, but... Uh, uh, so the, the single most important thing in, in Australia, I think, was that there was a commitment to give this the time that it needed uh, so that the bishops had begun talking about it uh, well before they started the process itself. And then the, the, the first stage of the process was actually getting people to make comments. Anyone who wanted to, to have any input at all about how they thought the church should be. Uh, and from that, they got 227,000 responses. Uh, now, it, it, that, that's a large number anyway. If you think of it in the context of Australia where the sum total of the population is only 26 million and where the Catholic population is probably... Uh, seven or eight, to, to get 200,000 people to respond is extraordinary. And then the time it 
was taken then to work those through to come up with uh, what might be the main themes. And then those themes went through a whole lot of development. We had the first meeting, the first assembly uh, took place over Zoom in October of last year. Uh, and then that was all refined again until you got to Sydney in July where it was reduced to eight themes. Uh, and th this is a, a particular thing to the Australian church, but the primary theme of the eight was about reconciliation with Indigenous people. Uh, it wasn't first about an inner church matter. It was about how the church is present uh, in the community. Uh, so it, th there, there was an incentive to do all of this out of what we call the Royal Commission, that the Royal Commission was set up by the Australian government to inquire into the responses to sexual abuse of children in institutions. That, that was really the immediate impetus. Uh, now, there's been no such national inquiry in this country. So, the, the, and, and equally then no pressure nationally on the bishops to form, find a way forward from this. So I think that, that actually made a contribution that was very important. Uh, beyond that, it's, it's the process, I think, Jeff, and, and the willingness to give space to the process. And, and then ultimately, even on the day in Sydney where everything fell apart for a good few hours, the willingness of the bishops to actually recognise that they were in a different situation here uh, and that it called forth a response from them that had to be something other than, well, we're in charge and we'll make the decision. It's that point of conversion that I think was utterly crucial to how this, to why this was able to work. The other thing I would say that's really important, and this links up with the discernment, is the process of what they, what were called spiritual conversations. That rather than the goal was simply to make decisions and to have votes, the goal was the listening to the spirit and, and taking time to go through that process. So the actual voting in Sydney in that week was a tiny percentage of, of the, the week. What really took the time during that week was people listening to each other, sitting as you are now at tables with the bishop simply amongst them. So Francis's model of the bishops amongst the people was part of what the, uh, the plenary council realised. So I, I, I hope that gives you some sense of, of what it was. I, I, I don't know how you would proceed here unless there is a commitment to really make it work and to put into it the time and effort that it takes. And my sense is that that's simply not, not there at the moment. But it, there's no reason why diocese by diocese can't do this. I mean, unless it's happening in parishes and in dioceses, it's not going to happen nationally. I mean, the, the thing about synodality is every aspect of the church's life needs to be synodal, not just at the national level or at the international level. And that we don't see it sufficiently at parish and diocese level makes it very difficult then to see it at national level. Yes, please. Thank you. Um, in relation to synodality, again, and this uh, reciprocal listening in within the church, um, let me ask you an ambitious uh, question. If you were um, Pope Francis, after listening to the patriarch of the Eastern Orthodox Church um, in relation to the war in Ukraine, from a practical perspective, after reciprocal listening, what would you do? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's fine. No, no, thank you. I, I, I look, I, I, I can understand why the, the history of Vatican diplomacy is such that you don't directly engage. I, I can understand why there's pressure to do so anyway. Uh, I, I think that's one of those dilemmas where you make a decision and you have to live with the consequence. Uh, 
whether you then have to revisit the decision at other times, I think that's also important. So you might say, this is the decision I would make now, but it may be at a different point I need to make a, a different decision. But uh, I, you know, I, I am prepared absolutely to grant that, that these things are horrible binds that none of us want to be in, in terms of making those decisions. Thank you, Father Richard, for the explanations that you have given. I'm keen at looking at synodality. I've read the document. I agree with the insights that you have given. But I'm also skeptical about it. That, you know, if it is not understood well, you know, it can take the church into a very delicate situation. And you know very well that the church is not a democracy as such. And so, how do you look at, you know, the insights of Pope Francis alongside the heritage of the church and alongside, you know, the temptation to lead it into kind of a democracy? Thank you. Thank you. If you begin with the, the recognition that the, the gift of the Spirit in our baptism empowers each one of us to contribute to the life of the church, then it, it, I don't think phrases like, it's not a democracy, in the end are terribly helpful because they, they suggest that what we're going to do is simply vote about everything and whoever gets 51% is going to win uh, no matter what the matter, what, what the issue is. I think if you, if you locate synodality in the context of discerning the movement of the spirit, and if everyone engaged in this enters into this as people needing conversion rather than as people who are lobbying for their own preferred outcome, then I think you change the framework for how you think about it. As I said, though, in, in answer to Jeff's question, uh, unless we have practices to show how this works, then we're going to perceive it as it's a dangerous thing because people are going to vote to you know, increase the number of persons in the Trinity, for example, uh, irrespective of what the faith of the church is. So I appreciate the dangers. I appreciate you know, the history of conciliarism and everything like that. But I also appreciate that if we're really open to the spirit and all the, if understand that not just as a romantic notion, but the implications of that that are very concrete and specific, including our need for conversion, including our willingness to think about how we view the practice of ministry and the practice of authority, uh, and are open to all of that, it actually will change the church in an absolutely positive way, not, not in a way where I can say these will be the outcomes. It's not that. But rather than the church being simply a top-down body, which is what Francis is trying to shift away from, we will learn there are other ways of being church that preserves the faith, that preserves the mission, and that also can lead us in new directions. I, I think we need the practice to see it rather than thinking of it simply as a theoretical construction. And, and you know, that's why I think for me, the example of the plenary council is so powerful because I saw it work. I saw what was possible without threatening the unity of the church, without threatening authority, without threatening ministry. And that's what, we, that's what we all need. We need to see how this is actually embodied. All right. We have a couple questions from the Zoom audience. Um, <clears throat> the first one says, I'm not sure I know how to be a collective presence to think collectively. And that may be a result of our individualistic culture. Would you have any pointers in that area? Practice, practice, practice. Uh, 
we do, we, it, it, again, if this is not merely a theory but a way of being, it, it's not going to be immediately explicable simply as an idea. We, we need to, to start doing this at every level of our life. And that, that's, that's where I think that there's so much concern about synodality simply because we have so little experience of doing it. The more we have experience of, of the willingness to be open to each other rather than I want my side to win, uh, the more there's a sense of I can learn by listening to you, then I think it does become more possible. But unless that happens and happens on the ground, then uh, it's all just going to seem impossible, I think. Great, thank you. Um, another question here. Um, do you think that some of the challenge we have is our repetitiousness? I don't mean tradition, but like there's something in the woodwork um, that we would, would necess necessitate breaking down in order to try something new. <laughs> I think for all of us, that, that phrase, well, we've always done it this way, it is, can be quite insidious to the willingness to, to try something, to be open at least to questions. Uh, my sense is that, that the, the, the repetition can be disrupted not by forcing people to do something different, but by encouraging people to question it to question whether there are other options, whether there are other possibilities. Uh, if that question is there, then there's at least an openness that we might come to a different place, that we won't just keep doing the things we've always done because we've always done those things, and that's easier to do that than to think about changing. I mean, this does call for something. Movement calls for something. I was using in my class the other week um, an article on the Holy Spirit by uh, uh, an African-American womanist theologian in the Baptist tradition who says there are two things about the Spirit. One is listening, and after you listen is moving. Uh, it's not enough just to listen unless you move. Uh, and that, I think, is how you overcome a sense of just routine. We have uh, one more here from <clears throat> the Zoom audience. Uh, in the context of your thoughts today, how do we as individuals live as pilgrims on a journey when faced with authoritarian clericalism that refuses to listen and only seeks to control and mandate? Your favorite question. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> let, me, let me make two points. W one is that I don't think even authoritarian clericalism affects every aspect of our life as pilgrims. So there's, there's, there's a way of living as who we are that no one can take away from me. No one can take away my own need for conversion in whatever circumstances, my own capacity to, uh, to, to be creative in terms of Christian life and so on. On the other hand, when we do experience that, I think it's a matter of trying to, the clericalism I mean, it's a matter of trying to reinforce what we've been talking about this morning, namely that that's at odds with a church that is about listening to the voices of the Spirit in all of the baptised. Because that's not, as I've been saying, that's not at odds with structure. It's not at odds with authority. It's actually calling structure and authority to a new way of being. So all I can do is just encourage people to keep keep trying to, to make the contribution they can make, but also to, to keep calling for a realisation of who we are as, as a church that is genuinely a church where everybody is gifted with the Spirit. Uh, and that authority has a place within that, not over against it. Mm -hmm.